everyone. Welcome back to English 112. This is for our class for Thursday, the 5th of October, where I wanted to talk a little bit more about those three short stories, um, Young Goodman Brown, Soldiers Home and Battle Royal. Put some closure onto our short story section, which would mean two more short stories for us, Girl on Popular Mechanics, and also talk about our upcoming first writing assignment. So, I had asked you to try to identify quotes that you thought, or a quote that you thought would be somewhat significant in terms of the stories that we've been covering thus far. And I wanted to share my favorites, actually, in terms of thinking about um, Soldier's Home. Uh, one of the things that I, well, actually, I suppose I should begin with Young Goodman Brown. I should go with the chronological order that um, the stories are placed in. And I, I'm well aware that Young Goodman Brown is an, a more difficult read because it is written in more archaic language. And again, we have to keep in mind that this was written for an 1800s audience. As we had discussed, it's very much about a critique of the simplistic views of Puritanism and the hypocrisy that exists within all of humanity. And one of my favorite quotes is when the traveler, and of course we know the story is deliberately ambiguous. Um, we will never know for certain whether there was a witch meeting or not. The traveler talks a little bit and for me, this is around paragraph 64 or so. Talks a little bit about the people in attendance at what would appear to be a witch meeting. Saying, there are all whom, you, whom ye have reverence from youth. Ye deem them holier than yourselves and shrink from your own sin. Contrasting it with their lives of righteousness and prayerful aspirations heavenward. Yet here they all are in my worshiping assembly. This night it shall be granted you to know their secret deeds. How hoary bearded elders of the church have whispered wanton words to the young maids of their households. And again, I know that we might have to detangle that sentence, but basically talking about how dirty old men are trying to corrupt young virgins in their households. How many a woman eager for widow's weeds has given her husband a drink at bedtime and let him sleep his last sleep in her bosom. Or how women eager to become widows have killed their husbands, poisoned them, so that they could no longer be married. And if no children were involved, there's a good chance that they would also gain access to the inheritance. How beerless youths have made, acts, uh, made haste to inherit their father's wealth. And also about money, how a young sons, rather than wait for their time to inherit, basically kill their fathers so that they can access the money. And how beard are, and also, and how dare da fair damsels, blush not sweet ones, have dug little graves in the garden and bidden me the sole guest to an infant's funeral. This is the idea about virgins basically aborting fetuses because of the consequences of being pregnant and being unmarried. And then killing and aborting these fetuses and burying them in the garden. So these are the realities of what appears behind the hypocrisies of um of the worshipers of Puritanism and those who attend church on a regular basis. And of course, when we're asked directly, had Goodman Brown fallen asleep in the forest and only dreamed a dream of a wild witch meeting? In paragraph 71, the answer, be it so if you will, in other words, whatever you wanna think, because ultimately it doesn't matter if there was a witch meeting We'll never know if there was a witch meeting. The witch meeting is deliberately um, ambiguous. So the author has put in enough pieces of evidence to suggest there is a witch meeting, enough pieces to suggest there isn't. But we know for certain is how Goodman has changed because of that witch meeting, that he becomes a darkly meditative, distrustful man with no hopeful verse upon his tomb. In other words, he is basically become so bitter and so angry 
over the realization that evil exists everywhere, that there isn't any possibility of salvation for him in the afterlife. He's going to go to hell. The lesson for us is that we shouldn't lose our faith. Again, his, the name of his wife, which is both the, his literal faith um, as a wife, but also his figurative faith in humanity and religion. And we should not um, duplicate Goodman's errors, which include not seeing the evil and hypocrisy within himself, or he never would have been on this journey in the first place. And then moving to our second piece, Soldier's Home. Lots of great quotes in this particular short story. One of my favorites is when his mother directly asks Krebs, of course, she calls him Harold because he's her son, but he's referenced as Krebs throughout the text, um, which takes away his individuality by referencing him by his surname, something that is also done in the military by referencing surnames. And she asks point blank, and this is around paragraph 72 or so. Don't you love your dear mother boy? And she says, he says, no. And she looked at him across the table. Her eyes were shiny. She started crying. I don't love anybody, Krep said. And it wasn't any good. He couldn't tell her. He couldn't make her see it. It was silly to have said it. He only heard her. And then he says, I didn't mean it. And he tries to take it back. Um, and then ultimately, after feeling somewhat sick and nauseated, he says, I know, Mommy, I'll try to be a good boy for you. Notice how he regresses in so many ways that he's, he goes back to childhood. And we don't know if his decision to go to Kansas City and get a job is good or bad, perhaps a bit of both. Um, perhaps he realizes that he's never going to change his family, so he may as well begin a new life. But one could also say that he's running away from his problems as well. And the idea that he goes to see his sister play indoor baseball, same sort of idea. It could be a positive because he's socializing and connecting, but it could also be a negative because he really doesn't want to do that, nor is he ready to do that. He spends his time basically ruminating about the war, getting his validation from reading books about the war, liking the maps in the books because Krebs is lost. He's looking for direction, which is what you do with the map. You look with direction and avoiding as many consequences as possible. So when his sister asks, and it's an innocent question, she doesn't mean anything erotic or incestual when she says, will you be my beau or will you be my boyfriend? It's easy for him to say yes, because he knows that it doesn't come with consequences. It's not serious. And then finally, Battle Royal, which is a very brutal, ugly piece, but racism is very brutal and ugly. And in this particular piece, one of the things that I find most interesting are the grandfather's dying words. And of course, we are reading a story out of context because it's a chapter in a novel that we aren't reading, but I try to fill you in on the novel, I believe, that what ends up happening after the short story when he's presented with the scholarship is that he does go to college with lots of hope and excitement, thinking that he can achieve dignity and respect, but that doesn't come to fruition because of the color of his skin. He realizes that the system, the educational system will never afford him dignity or respect. So he tries then to enter the political system to try to change things politically and with a lot of hope and excitement and then comes to the realization that he's never going to be given the opportunity to change the political system because of the color of his skin, because of the racism that exists. And then finally, he thinks about revolution and revolt and he, he joins with a character who's aptly named Ross the Destroyer. And after they try to destroy their society and the invisible man sees it burning around him and after the um, riot that they help instigate, he realizes that that isn't the answer either. He's just hurting himself and others. And at that point, he decides to hibernate quite telling because hibernation assumes that ultimately there will be an awakening or reawakening in a Caucasian neighborhood that he would never be accepted in. And he breaks into a basement 
and he's surrounded by darkness in this basement because darkness and light are major themes um, as well as is vision and blindness, one of the reasons why he's blindfolded. And then ultimately, even though he's surrounded by dark, he's rigged up all of these electric lights and this gives illumination. Um, he also is stealing light, stealing these lights from the electric company or the power company, a major theme throughout the novel as he contemplates what to do and we're never given an answer because the answer didn't exist during this time period and still doesn't exist in our time period. The challenge is how do we combat these social ills like racism? Though sexism is also embedded in this text too, as we talked about with the naked blonde with the tattoo of the American flag on her navel. So she's supposed to symbolize or represent America the idea that the American dream is really quite superficial. You can look, but you can never really achieve it. Unless, of course, you happen to be part of the very privileged few who have power and access in society. And neither women nor black men are part of that particular group. So when I, I, I think about Battle Royal and how the Invisible Man needs to learn this, it's a coming of age story, almost like Young Goodman Brown is a coming of age story. But the quote that I find so particularly interesting is when the grandfather says on his deathbed, I suppose on your deathbed, you'll tell the truth. Son, after I'm gone, I want you to keep up the good fight. I never told you, but our life is a war. And I've been a traitor all my born days, a spy in the enemy's country since I gave back my gun in the reconstruction. You think about a spy, basically what they're doing is they're infiltrating enemy territory in order for um, information, recognizance, so that they can bring that back to um, their side and then hopefully use that to their advantage. So basically it's all been an act, this, this sense of being meek and humble that the grandfather has maintained for years that he says, I've been living with my head in the lion's mouth. Think about how dangerous it would be to live with your head in the lion's mouth. That I've been overcoming them with yeses, undermining them with grins, agreeing them to death and destruction. Of course, even if we haven't read the entire novel, we can get a sense of what's going to happen um, because at the ending of the story, the invisible man has this nightmare about the grandfather taunting him and they're at a circus and the grandfather refuses to laugh at the clowns. In other words, the grandfather is being deliberately defiant. And of course, we could also say that the society in which Invisible Man lives is a kind of circus. It's all very surreal. And the grandfather gives him envelope after envelope after envelope to open up, almost like those Russian nesting dolls, for instance. The idea that he, Invisible Man, was never going to get to an answer. And then at the end, he's to hold, using the N-word no less, but I think this is quite indicative of the time period. So these pieces are really historical lenses into their time as well. Just like the assumption in Soldier's Home is that Krebs is going to acclimate into society by finding a girl and settling down. No other options are considered for Krebs at this point. Very indicative of 1925. Um, but nevertheless, the idea here is that almost like a, a hamster on a, on, a, on a running wheel, Krebs is going to be kept continually chasing after an American dream and never realizing it, as the grandfather says, keep the send boy running. So those three pieces, you know, I'm, I, I encourage you to read as I always do, your classmates' responses and my responses in turn. That'll give you a chance to duplicate as much as possible the classroom discussion we would have about important quotes for all three of these, but I've just shared some of mine. And what's left are two short stories, one called Girl and one entitled Popular Mechanics. And you might notice in the notes below that I have the author reading her short story, Girl, which I think is quite a treat. It's approximately a four hour, or four hour, I'm sorry, a four minute long video, definitely not a four hour long video. Um, and the story is almost like a poem when you read it. It's a list. And I, I, I can admit that I, I almost don't assign this text um, because the theme about um, the way that women are viewed in society um, is something that we've talked about earlier in the semester with Story of an Hour and also talked about with A Sorrowful Woman. But 
we've been mostly working with Western texts and I wanted to give something from Antigua. So this is a different cultural lens and yet many of the expectations are quite similar. Cooking and cleaning, the assumption is that we have a mother figure, an adult, giving a list of rules to this girl um, who is the daughter figure about how to be successful in society. A list of rules and expectations for female in the 1970s Antigua. Many might still be applicable today. With the repetition of the phrase, to not become the slut, I know you're so bent on becoming. And this really illustrates the idea of the importance of sexual purity in terms of viewing female during the time period. And when you watch the video, you'll see the audience re response to that phrase, which is repeated several times, this kind of nervous laughter, um, which goes to show that even in contemporary times, there's still some discomfort with female sexuality and just the terms associated with sexuality. And the girl speaks twice here. Um, at one point, she objects and says that she doesn't sing Ben in Sunday school, which would be considered inappropriate from their cultural perspective. So that's something you wouldn't necessarily see in the United States. And the mother completely ignores the girl, continues on with the list. And then ultimately, the mother is confronted with the question, um, what if the baker won't let me squeeze the bread? Because the mother says this is how you get the baker to squeeze the bread. And um, the mother is stunned, is saying that, you mean to say, after all I've said, you'd be the kind of woman that the baker wouldn't let squeeze the bread? In other words, if the girl follows these rules, she'll have access and opportunity in society. That's what bread represents. In this particular instance, um, access and opportunity. Though it could be literal, of course, if you went to a bakery, you're not supposed to squeeze the bread. Um, so how do you get access to something that you normally wouldn't get access to? Bread oftentimes is used as a slang term for money, so that works quite nicely as well. How do you get money and access? And embedded within all of these rules are some rather surprising ones. Um, this is how you spit. And um, this is not very ladylike spitting or this is how you throw away a child before it even becomes a child. In other words, this is how you abort, which seems completely surprising, especially with the emphasis of sexual purity. So embedded within all of the rules that one has to publicly follow um, in order to gain um, respect within society, one being female and society being 1970s Antigua, there are also ways to subvert the system. This is how you can squeeze the bread, this is how you can spit in the air. This is how you can make a medicine to throw away a child before it even becomes a child. And I have some rather helpful advice as well. This is how you smile at someone you don't like very much. You know, so in other words, how to negotiate social relationships. So I, I think the text is interesting from that perspective. But honestly, the reason why I signed this text is because of the use of the semicolon which you may have noticed in reading this, that instead of periods at the ending of each sentence, there are semicolons. Basically, a semicolon is a long pause, not a stop. And what we get with the use of the semicolon is that basically there's no opportunity to even stop with these lists of rules. It's just completely overwhelming, one after another after another. There's not even time to breathe. So I think that using the semicolon in this way helps to support what's happening thematically within the story. Quite clever from the author's perspective. It wasn't that the author didn't know how to use the semicolon. And I, I found that, that writers oftentimes are rather hesitant to use the semicolon. The semicolon is used between two complete sentences that are closely related to one another. And yes, two sentences that are next to one another have a close relationship. But if you want to emphasize that close relationship even further, you use a semicolon. But you're supposed to do this rather sparingly, only for very special occasions. And certainly you're not supposed to use it in place of the period, which is what we see in this particular piece. Um, so this is Jamaica Kincaid making a statement with punctuation. And that said, I, I, I wanted to make sure that I, I had this story because I think it's a great transition to talking a little bit about writing papers. And we do have another story, um, Popular Mechanics, um, that I wanted to talk about. Probably I'll get to it in greater depth next class. It's a um, 
example of minimalist writing, and while Ernest Hemingway didn't write in a very, um, um, let's say, long-winded fashion, um, he was known for wanting to be precise and concise. Um, Raymond Carver takes it to a different level. Even its title, you know, Popular Mechanics, just two words, but it suggests so much. Popular being commonplace, and perhaps the story we're reading about in 1981 is quite commonplace. And mechanics, which could mean the idea of two forces working against one another. And that definitely works in terms of what's happening with the story. Popular Mechanics is also the name of a magazine that talks about how to fix things. And in this story, we are basically given instructions on how to break things. And you may or may not have noticed that Raymond Carver also does something odd in terms of punctuation. There are no quotation marks that are used around the direct statements, the quotes. And we know we're supposed to use quotation marks in order to be able to give credit to somebody when they're speaking. Might I suggest that one of the reasons why perhaps there are no quotation marks is because the dialogue we get is so commonplace, hence the title comment, that there really isn't any need to give attribution as we basically get a couple who's fighting. Um, it's the ending of a relationship and they're fighting over the possession of their child. And I use that term deliberately, possession. They're treating the child as if it's an it. Um, and if you are familiar with the biblical story of Solomon, then you can understand how Raymond Carver is playing off of that story with a modern day twist. In the biblical story of Solomon, two women claim to be the parent of a baby and go to King Solomon. And since they can't resolve the dispute, King Solomon proposes that they resolve the dispute by splitting that child in half so that each woman can have half of the child. That would be fair. One woman steps forward and says that, no, she doesn't want that. Let's just give the child to the other woman. And King Solomon says to the woman who had stepped forward, you must be the biological mother because only a biological mother would be willing to sacrifice her own self-interest for the welfare of her child. You know, and that's the moral of the story. Fast forward to 1981 America, when divorce is becoming much more common and, 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 and um, popular, certainly not to the extent that it is today. So we're still experiencing tensions in society with relationship and how ultimately to resolve conflict within relationship. And even still, we hear in 2023 about vicious custody battles where our children are basically treated like possessions where they have to move from one household to another. I apologize for that noise. I don't know if you hear or not, but the, they're doing some yard work outside. So I hope you can hear me. But basically um, what, what I was saying is that um, they're treating this child much like it was a possession or a piece of property and they both argue over the child and ultimately, well, in this issue, in this way, the issue was decided. They both pull on the child as hard as they can. And what that results in, even though we aren't given the gory details, is that child being torn in two. Um, in other words, they killed that child, which is not the ending we want, but is the ending we get. And again, I'll talk a little bit more about girl and popular mechanics next class to put some closure on them. But I really wanted to talk about our upcoming paper which is going to be based on this unit, short story. And as you know, I've uploaded some possible paper topics in our syllabus and other documents folder. And I deliberately try to choose topics that didn't necessarily require um, or could even achieve a right or wrong answer that it's very debatable because I'm interested in your reasoning. And the first two options are about canon those works considered by scholars and critics to be worth literary study, uh, which is basically asking you to judge quality. How do you judge quality in a work? Is it that it's creative? Is it that it, it talks about timeless and universal themes? Is it that it has some sort of social statement to make? Um, is it that it requires you to think? You know, we had laid all of these possible criteria out for canon, but even that can be somewhat debated. So if you decided to choose canon to identify a work that we've read in our short story section that either you think qualifies as canon, that is worthy of academic study, and of course you would detail the reasons why with evidence from the text, or work that does not qualify as canon in your opinion, 
and again detailing the reasons why in your in, in your analysis or perhaps you would prefer to talk about contemporary relevance and to identify a work in our short story section a piece of fiction that we've read that you think still has contemporary relevance again focusing on the work not on our contemporary society or you could do the opposite that uh, a piece of work that you feel no longer has contemporary relevance again focusing on the work and detailing why but those are merely my suggestions i encourage you to create your own paper topic um, you do need to have the topic approved by me however and you do want to make sure that your topic is addressing one of the texts that we've read in our short story section and my suspicion is that you've already talked about some of the elements about how to write a paper and I also have some suggestions for you in the notes below. I've also uploaded a handout about the critical paper, which is what you're doing. You're not using outside resources. You're relying on your own analysis and your own interpretations. And actually this handout was a handout that was given to me in my college days, believe it or not. I've kept it all these years. It's still one of the best that I've seen out there. But I know that you've probably had um, experiences with prior English classes. You might have even kept some of your notes or texts on how to write a paper. And as you will see in the notes that I've included below, there are websites, things like Purdue OWL, which is a terrific website. I don't know if you've talked about it in other English classes. It was put out by Purdue University, but it's free and accessible to the public. It talks about the entire writing process or even the GCC library. The GCC library is well aware that students will be writing papers and they have a link on their library site about how to write papers and how to document. And of course, I'll be talking a little bit about this as well in this class and also the next class as well. And you might notice that in our syllabus, I had some grading criteria and that said, everybody has the option of rewriting the first paper. I see it as a learning exercise. So once you've submitted in that paper, I will evaluate it and return it back to you with commentary. And you are free to do a revision if you so like. And I ask that you incorporate my commentary. If you need additional feedback and instruction, just reach out to me. I ask that you submit in your revision um, along with the original graded copy to me so that I can compare and contrast and then you get the higher of the two grades. You would have up until the ending of the semester to do this, but the sooner the better for everybody involved. And as you know, I have rolling deadlines in the semester, but my hope is that by the midpoint of the semester, which was the date that I had selected for us, that you would have submitted in that first paper. But basically at any point now, you could submit in that first paper. And if you haven't submitted in that first paper by the midpoint of the semester, let me know what's going on because I'm beginning to get a bit anxious because we're halfway through. You haven't done a formal assignment yet. And in terms of our second paper, that'll be due at the ending of the semester. And there probably won't be time to rewrite it, but you probably wouldn't need time to rewrite it because you would have learned how to write with your first paper assignment. So you're just basically duplicating what you did with the first paper, but this time, rather than writing about short story, you would be writing about dramas, which is the unit that we're headed into. And dramas are longer than short stories, so we're reading only three dramas, but these are some pieces that have linked to them. So we've got multiple classes devoted to drama, not just reading them, but watching performance. Perhaps the reason why Shakespeare is so unpopular is because people's experience with Shakespeare is reading it rather than watching a performance. So we will watch performance. It would be ideal if we could see something live. That's just not logistically possible, but at least we can watch something that's been recorded. And um, that said, um, even though we have multiple classes devoted to each of the dramas, what would be ideal is that once you've started reading a drama, that you continue reading it and you finish it in its entirety so that by the time we begin talking about a particular drama, you're done reading that drama. And as we're talking about that drama for several classes, you're working on the next drama. So by the time we get to the next drama, we have multiple classes devoted to that. You've read it in its entirety. So that by the time you get to the third drama that um, you've already read in its entirety, 
then you can begin thinking about writing a paper because um, while we're talking about that third drama over several classes, we'll also be talking about paper number two. That said, if you can try to get in paper number two early enough, then you can try to negotiate the possibility of a revision with me, but it's not guaranteed. It's something that you have to negotiate. Um, but certainly everybody has that option with the first paper. And you'll notice that I've given criteria in the syllabus, much like, I suppose, you know, the criteria for quality that you might want to evaluate for um, canon if you are choosing that paper topic. But the criteria for an A paper is that it develops a clear central idea with originality and the depth of thought and displays a consistent sense of audience. Its topic is developed with clear and logical ideas. Organization is sound. Paragraphs are based on core ideas supported by fitting examples and illustrations. And those paragraphs are connected together with smooth transitions and links. The sentences are well put together and buried, and there are very few errors in grammar, punctuation, and spelling. So that would be an excellent. A B, or good paper, would be that it has a clearly stated central idea, but it lacks the energy or the depth of thought of an A. It draws safe conclusions, but the topic is interesting, focused adequately, logically developed. Organization is correct and logical, but sometimes it strains a bit. Though paragraphs do have some central ideas and some logical points, but some of the transitions may not necessarily be smooth or obvious. Sentences have little variety in structure, and we're beginning to see some patterns of errors in grammar, spelling, and punctuation. The C paper, the satisfactory paper, has a reasonably clear central idea and shows an adequate grasp of the reason for the assignment. So you've satisfied the criteria of the assignment. But focus can be blurred. The development with its examples or illustrations can be sketchy. Um, organization isn't always clear. Most paragraphs have a sense of organization, but the development can be vague. Transitions are awkward, sometimes even lacking. And now we're beginning to see patterns of mistakes in grammar, spelling, and punctuation. The D paper. Um, the less than satisfactory paper. It, it doesn't state or develop a central idea, though the pattern shows the writer has some central concept of what the assignment is. The, the sense of audience is oftentimes inconsistent. Organization being hard to follow. Frequently, paragraphs lack a central idea. Transitions between paragraphs are scanty or absent. Um, sentences are awkward or incorrectly constructed. The writing does not indicate college level proficiency, and now we're seeing frequent errors. Um, I can tell you that oftentimes I, if we're in this area, I need to reread a paper multiple times in order to understand what the author is trying to say. And the F paper has no central idea, no connections to a single topic. Writing is oftentimes contradictory, characterized by many apparent changes of subject. There's really no evidence of overall editing or writing beyond a first draft. Many sentences, if not most, have errors in construction. Paragraphing is haphazard or even absent. Many errors in grammar, punctuation, and spelling. And obviously, this is criteria that we assume would be in place when we're reading a piece of fiction that yes, we've got paragraphs and we've got correct spelling and so forth. Um, when we're talking about canon, we're talking about something that's much more sophisticated. Is it worth analytic study in an academic classroom? But the criteria for grading gives you an idea of how papers are evaluated because judgment calls are made for that as well. And in terms of writing papers, as I had indicated, I, I've got that handout that I encourage you to read that I'll talk about a little bit further. But you'll notice that that handout is divided up into three stages, planning, writing, and editing. I can tell you most writers skip the planning stage and go straight to the writing stage and try to write the perfect first sentence. And they lose a lot of time doing that, so much that they oftentimes don't have time to edit. So I really encourage you to start thinking now with planning. And the planning stage, what's so wonderful about it is that it's for your eyes only. I suggest you take notes because you're likely to forget things, but you should have ideas percolating at this point. And 
whether or not you want to brainstorm or whether or not you want to free write, there's lots of language that's used for basically planning or generating ideas. Um, I personally like lists. It's the way that I organize things. As you can see beneath my videos, my class notes, and these are my class notes that I'm sharing with you. They're organized in list fashion. So this is kind of what works best for me. Of course, you have to work with what's best for you. But hopefully you start early and planning and then you can leave it and then go back to it later. And then you can determine which pieces you wanna pursue and which ones you don't. Again, the beauty of it is that you don't have to worry about grammar or mechanics or any of it. And you don't even have to worry about content as to whether or not it's a good or bad idea. Then you can go to the writing and begin to formulate things into sentences and paragraphs, but they don't have to be perfect. This is what you do in the editing stage where you polish and you develop. So that said, I know a lot of people skip the editing stage because they've loved, they've run out of energy or they've run out of time. So again, I want you to put a little bit of extra into the editing stage, a little bit of time and energy. You need to have an introductory or paragraph, which is an opening paragraph that gives your thesis, which is your main point as well as list the name of the author and the name of the text. And after reading the first paragraph, your reader should be clear about what it is you're going to be writing about and, and, and what text you're examining. And I know that sometimes you don't know your thesis until you've actually done some significant writing. You can actually skip the first paragraph, begin writing, summarize what you've written in one or two sentences, and then construct a first paragraph that basically offers that summary in one or two sentences. That could be your thesis. So you can work backwards, backwards in effect. Um, I've done it myself, actually. Then you need to have body paragraphs. Note that in the plural, more than one. This is where you give your evidence, your details. You basically are much like a courtroom attorney. You're putting together an argument based on the evidence that exists in the text. And if we were to continue on with this analogy, then I suppose I'm the judge and I need to remain neutral. Regardless of my personal opinion or belief, I need to be convinced by you of your position. So basically what you're doing is you're putting together quotation, sometimes direct quotes from the text word for word. You know, I think about a quote like from Mrs. Mallard and story of an hour saying that she feels free, free, free. What a great quote that would be to prove that she feels free. Yes, you can put in your own language, but she actually says it. So why not quote it? But you can paraphrase, put it in your own language as well. And you will probably use a mixture of the two when you're writing a paper. And you need to have a conclusion, which is a paragraph that's devoted just to giving closure. You don't want to put any new ideas, but you don't want to repeat everything that you've said in the introduction, certainly not word for word. Uh, perhaps you can relate at, uh, or you can hint at a related work by the same author. Perhaps you can talk about contemporary times. Nine out of 10 times relating the piece of literature to today is a way that you can conclude. Um, by giving a sense of closure, not adding any new arguments. If you've got new arguments, that goes in your body paragraph. And a paragraph has to be three or more sentences long, including the introduction and the conclusion. And it's probably a lot longer than that, but you need to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And if, uh, and I know the media doesn't do that, so you might be reading a newspaper article that is just one sentence long, but we aren't writing in that context, we're writing an academic argument and the rules of academic arguments follow the same kinds of rules that you would be following in the workplace, let's say, if you were writing a report about profit margins. So you can transfer those skills over. So you need to have three or more sentences for a paragraph. And if you've got well-written paragraphs, as the handout talks about, you should have a topic sentence, which is the first sentence of the paragraph that summarizes what the paragraph is about. It doesn't always have to happen, but if you are writing strong paragraphs, you should be able to read the first